Can sin truly be forgiven? If so, was Christ's death necessary? If not, does that mean the Bible contradicts itself? Welcome to Beggar and Bread. Hey everyone, welcome back. My name is Justin Bauer, I'm your host, and today we'll be talking about a tough question, but one that I think is very interesting and definitely something that we should look into. So the question is, can sin truly be forgiven? And really what brought me to this question um, is a quote by Josh Bales. I'll read this to you. It says, no sin is actually forgiven. All sins are punished either once for all in Christ on your behalf or in you for eternity. So that's an interesting quote, I would say, um, because if we are Christians and we grew up knowing what the Bible says about sins or any really general idea of what Christianity is and what salvation is, we talk about sins being forgiven and we talk about being forgiven of your sins. Now, even the Bible says that you can be forgiven of your sins, and we're going to talk about Bible verses that say that, that God forgives sins. And then we're going to continue and ask a few more questions such as, what does the Bible say about people being forgiven versus sins being forgiven? We're also going to talk about sins being punished versus people being punished for their sins. So in this episode, we're really going to dive into hopefully all aspects of this question, Um, to really understand the theology behind this, because I really believe that if you think about this question with a theological mindset and it stumps you, then it could really bring you to a sad conclusion that the Bible isn't consistent. Now, as a believer, personally, I believe that the Bible is consistent through and through. Obviously, it was written by a divine author, God, and so it plays together perfectly with his scripture. So we're going to look into that. And really, this isn't for us to become more skeptical of scripture, but rather to be more affirmed, more faithful, and more ground in scripture. That's why we're doing this podcast. Honestly, these episodes, I hope, will bring you to a deeper knowledge of the Bible, better understanding of theology. So in order to start this off right, we have to start with a good foundation of really what the Bible says about sinners and also what what God says about sin. So we're going to look at a few passages, and of course we're going to look in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but try to correlate them together and see what the Bible really says about that. From there, we'll talk about what the Bible says about sins being punished Uh, about people being forgiven and sins being forgiven. And then I'll pose an interesting concept to you and try to defend it, see what you think. So first, we're going to talk about what God says about sinners and sin. Many of you have probably heard the popular quote that God hates the sin and loves the sinner. Well, R.C. Sproul has something to say about that. So he actually says, it has been said that God hates the sin and loves the sinner. But he doesn't just send the sin to hell. He sends the sinner there. So really what R.C. Sproul is trying to convey in this message is that there is some opposition between God and the sinner in Scripture. The first verse that we're going to look at is Psalm 5, 5 through 6. And basically it says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. Verse 6 says, You destroy those who speak lies, and the Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. So what does that mean? It shows that God not only opposes the sin of deceit, but he also abhors the bloodthirsty and the deceitful man. So we see that God hates the evildoer, that he opposes the evildoer, and he'll destroy those who speak lies. So it's true that sin embodied is what God hates. And so that means that that person God stands against as well. Before we continue, I want to make a very important point 
Um, many people might say, well, that's the Old Testament. Um, they might even refer to it as the Old Covenant. I would like to remind you that we can still see grace in the Old Testament. One big reason is because of the covenants that God made with his people. So many times Israel broke that covenant by sinning against the Lord through the law, but the covenant was one-sided. God was the one who kept it the entire time. It wasn't a contractional thing where we had to keep our end of the deal as well, but really it was just upon God to keep that covenant, and he did, and he has since then. So we can see grace and mercy in the Old Testament, but we see it even more displayed through the life of Christ in the New Testament. With that being said, we're going to look at passages in the New Testament that talk about sins being punished, also about responsibility for those sins. So a very um, prominent verse is in Galatians 6, where it says, you reap what you sow. And James chapter 1 says that sin, when it was conceived, it will conceive a baby that will grow out to be death. So it's clear that in the New Testament, it's still a truth that people are accountable for their own sin. And God is the one who brings forth that punishment. This is consistent with John 3.36, that he is the one who blots out sins, but also the one who pours out wrath. This is consistent with Romans 3.25 that says God is the just and the justifier. So really we see the responsibility that we as humans have to be accountable for our sins. So with that as our biblical understanding of what sin is, the accountability that is held to us as humans who participate in that sin and what comes out of that. Obviously, we know Romans 3 says that the wages of sin is death. We know that in John 3, 16, we have been saved from hell and given eternal life. So we know that the wages of sin is death, that our destination is hell before that sin is taken up. But let's talk about what the Bible says about people or sins being forgiven. Just a fun fact, there are over 100 Bible verses in the Bible that talk about forgiveness or forgiveness of sins. Now, there are many popular ones, especially during the life of Jesus Christ. Um, One of those is Luke 5, verse 20. So there's this paralytic who is sitting outside of the temple begging and pleading for someone to take him inside. And Jesus comes up and he says, your sins are forgiven you. And then the Pharisees turn around and tell him that that's a problem because they basically quote scripture and ask, who does he think he is that he blots out sins, that he forgives sins? Well, Jesus, knowing their hearts, turns around and says, why do you question me? He says, is it easier for someone to say, your sins are forgiven or pick up your bed and walk. And so eventually he says to the man, pick up your bed and walk. So he blots out that transgression. He says, your sins are forgiven you. And then he also says, pick up your bed and walk and proving that he is a supernatural God and man being. So we see that he says, sins are forgiven you. And then of course, we need to look at what Jesus says on the cross when he's about to die as he's being crucified. In Luke 23, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He doesn't say, forgive them of their sins. He doesn't even say, forgive the sin. He says, forgive them. So that's a very interesting distinction that you can look at to make sure that this concept that I'm going to propose to you is consistent. And we'll look at these verses again with a new light after this. So with that being said, I want to propose this concept to you that I have come up with um, personally. I haven't seen much written about it or haven't read much about it, but if there is anything about it out there, I will link it into the show notes or you can let me know by contacting us on uh, social media. Here's the concept that sin can only be punished or forgiven while attached to a host. This is consistent in the Old Testament, considering that sins were paid for through the sacrificial system. So, 
that means that animals' blood were spilled for the people of Israel's sins to be forgiven. This is also consistent with the reason that Christ needed to die. So as in the beginning, I asked the question, if sins are forgiven, was Christ's death necessary? Well, to answer that question, I want to direct you to 2 Corinthians 5.21. This is a popular verse, but one that I think is really important in understanding sins being forgiven and really the punishment for sins as well. So it says that for our sake, Christ became sin, who knew nothing of sin, that we might become righteousness, though we have none ourselves. So what does that mean? That means that Christ took upon himself the sins of the world, not just the sins of Israel, not just the sins of one man, like in the Old Testament, but the sins of the entire world. He embodied that. He became that. So much so that God the Father had to look away from his own son on the cross because he is so holy he cannot look upon sin. And during all of that, there was this divine transfer. We became righteousness that we never could have attained on our own. As sinful people, we knew nothing of righteousness. Titus 3 says that we were hated by each other. We were hating one another. The book of Ephesians says that we were children of wrath. Nothing in us was righteous. So that is consistent with the concept that I proposed to you that sin can be punished only when attached to a host and sin can be forgiven only when attached to a host. So next I would like to point out Psalm 103, 12, which is also another popular verse. Um, and I'll just read it to you here. It says, as far as the East is from the West, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And I really think that you need to look at a somewhat popular verse in the book of Leviticus to understand this passage in Psalm 103. So in Leviticus, God is laying out the law of sacrifices and atonement. And in chapter 16, verse 21 and 22 Um, God lays out what is supposed to be done with the sins of the people on the day of atonement. So he says, and he shall put on them. So he says, and he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. This is the key verse right here. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Yet he embodied sin so that we could embody righteousness. And really what we're seeing here is this theology that is paralleled to what Christ did on the cross. So we have this goat in Leviticus 16 that shows that he bears all of the sins. Um, The blood was put on his head and he went far away into really he went to another camp to take the sins away from the people of Israel. Now he embodied that sin. So then you ask yourself, what does that have to do with Psalm 103? And then also with the concept that I already proposed. And so we ask ourselves this, what did Christ do on the cross that was so different, that was so pivotal and so powerful that it worked, that Christ himself embodied that sin? That is the answer. Really, the way that Christ got rid of our sins, the way that God is able to say that I cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. God in Christ became the lamb, not even the goat. He was a better version of this scapegoat idea in Leviticus. He became the lamb, the perfect sacrifice. 
and was sent away. So he was sacrificed on the altar of the cross with all of our sins placed on his head. And then he was exiled to the grave. That sin was exiled out of the camp of our hearts, out of the temple of our bodies, into the wilderness that was the grave. After that, he rose and left those sins in the wilderness and came back. He came back to live with us, to live among us. So that is how these sins can be exiled as far as the east is from the west. And really, that does not forfeit anything with the concept that sin can only be punished and forgiven when attached to a host. So now we look at the next verse that is probably the most pivotal in this theology, in this conversation that we're looking at here is 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. So this verse is one of the most, what I would say is one of the most connecting verses in the New Testament that gives us a glimpse of how the Old and New Testament still go hand in hand today and how we can realize that Like I said earlier, that old covenant is not an old covenant, but a covenant that God has always kept. So let's look at verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5 and see what it says. It says that for our sake, he made him, that's Jesus Christ, to be sin who knew nothing of sin, that we might become his righteousness. So what you see on the cross is if our sins are placed on the head of Christ and he embodies all of them, the sins of the world on himself at the cross and takes that to the exile of the grave, then what do we get in return? So I want to pose another small theological concept that is in scripture that Christ became sin so much so that his righteousness was transferable. So this is what we call substitutionary atonement. What we see on the cross is all righteousness and purity in Christ was taken away and given to us. So there's this divine exchange of sin and righteousness. So in a way, I would argue, and I want to hear your feedback on this. So write on social media, contact me, let me know what you think about this. But in a way... When Christ was on the cross, he was devoid of righteousness. So much so that God turned his face. He turned his back on him because he can't look at sin. Well, in Christ's righteousness and his God-man character, he was able to overcome that sin. When he rose from the grave, he left the sin and death in the grave conquering it forever, embodying that righteousness so that we can embody that righteousness as well. So now it is time to answer that question. Can sin truly be forgiven? With everything that you've heard in this episode today, what do you think? Do you think that sin itself can be forgiven or that people are forgiven while sin is is punished in someone, in a host. For us as believers, let's go back to that quote. For us as believers, sin is either punished in Christ for all of eternity or in us for all of eternity. So what do you think? Uh, Let me know. I'm really interested because I've wrestled with this question for quite some time before and definitely during writing this episode. Um, And it's not a question I ever thought that I would have to answer. It's not a common question in Christianity. I feel like this is one thing that's generally understood. But as far as my research goes and what I've studied in writing this episode, it seems that this quote is accurate, that sin is always punished on Christ or on us but people are forgiven. So I'm going to actually quote one of my friends. He's a good friend of mine, Noah Parker. I first saw this quote actually in one of the group chats that I have with my friends from church. And so he sent this 
uh, quote in and we were kind of sharing our thoughts and working through that. Um, and Noah Parker said one thing that is very uh, compelling, really. And it was a good way to sum up a confusing quote or a quote that maybe I overthought by Josh Bales. Um, but Noah said this. He said, sins aren't forgiven. People are. And really, that might be the conclusion. That might be the way to wrap our finite minds around all of this. To say that sin is not something that is a necessarily living thing, but something that is an act. So it's committed by people. So that means that it can either be punished in the person that commits it or on Christ. So I hope this episode has been very helpful for you. Uh, I hope that it has caused you to think about what you know to be Christianity today. I want you to ponder this. I want you to reach out, ask questions, share your thoughts if you have any. And I want this to be something that can grow your faith. I want this to be something that you can ponder and really understand what true salvation is, what reconciliation is what Christ did on the cross because we want to understand that even better and deeper in quotes in studying scripture so I pray that this has been helpful to you with that being said I would like to conclude this episode so as always you can find the show notes below check out our website for blog posts and updates follow us on social media and let us know what you think about this And my friends and fellow beggars, I hope you are all well. 